Uh, yeah. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the 30th London Accessibility Meetup. Um, my name is Andy Ronksley. Um, my name is Catherine Moonan, and I am the Accessibility Specialist with Sainsbury's. And I just want to give a quick plug that we are hiring for an accessibility specialist. It's a really exciting role. And if you'd like to know more about it, you can search Sainsbury's Accessibility Specialist on LinkedIn. Or I will be hovering round by the drinks uh, during the interval. And you can come and grab me or ask one of our staff to uh, introduce you. And I will tell you about the role. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to the lovely Andy. <laughs> good. I'm all good. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Catherine. Okay, so welcome everyone to London Accessibility number 30 today. So it feels like a bit of a milestone. It's not 30 years, but our 30th event. So who's the uh, first event this evening? <laughs> That's probably about half the room. So welcome. Um, I hope it's the first of many. Uh, I hope you enjoy this evening. Um, if you want to find the meetup on Twitter, uh, we are at, the handle is Ali London, and we also use the hashtag uh, Ali London as well. If you're not sure, uh, Ali or A11Y is a kind of unique way of saying accessibility. So it's the A and the Y, the first and the last letter of accessibility, and then the 11 characters in between. Uh, we have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you search for Accessibility London, um, you'll find the live streams from today and also all the videos from the previous three or four years. So a very good resource. Uh, a little bit underused at the minute, so please make use of it. Please spread the word. A little bit about me. My name is uh, Andy Ronksley, as Catherine mentioned. I'm a freelance digital accessibility specialist. I'm, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn if you want to find out a bit, more, a bit more about what I do. Uh, where's Jane? Jane, Jane, please. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to embarrass you a bit today. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, today's the 30th meetup um, and uh, a lot of you probably don't know that the meetup had very humble beginnings uh, and it was started by uh, a company called PCR Digital. These are uh, a couple of photos from the first one that I went to, uh, quite low res I'm afraid, uh, but I think there was about 24 people came to this one yeah. uh, and it was a TV on a desk, uh, there was no live captioning, there was no live stream on YouTube, um, you, it was so small and twee, we all had individual name badges, uh, but it was really lovely. And um, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to, to Jane and PCR, because without, without that, we might not have the great event that we have uh, today. So thank you, Jane. <laughs> so Jane runs a company called PCR Digital. They have some really great accessibility jobs most of the time, so please check them out on Twitter. She is PCRJaneA, and they are PCRDigital.com. Jane comes to most of the meetups, so she's over there. Wave. <laughs> That's the end of your embarrassment. 
<laughs> if you want to use the Wi-Fi today, uh, O2 Wi-Fi is the network to connect to. Um, you'll need to give it some details like your name and address, a phone number. Um, but that's the, the, the network to connect to if you have a bad signal down here, which most people do. Um, if you want to ask questions today, there's two ways you can do that. So we'll have mics uh, after the end of each talk. Uh, but if you prefer to ask a question uh, anonymously or just via text message, uh, if you go to slido.com on your device, uh, the code we have for today is 4392. It's so on the home page. You just enter 4392, and it'll take you to the room we have set up for today. And you can ask a question, and they'll come through to, to me and the other organizers. Quick hand up exercise that we normally do. So um, just to get a feel for who's in the room, what kind of uh, jobs people are working in, um, who's working in accessibility directly? Probably about half the room. Um, anyone a developer? It's probably about a quarter. Uh, designers? Probably about another quarter, I'd say. Um, content people? It's probably about a third. Um, policy? <coughs> One, two. Okay, you're not alone. Um, anyone working uh, for a corporate? Probably about 20 or so. Um, public sector? Uh, it's probably about 30. Um, third sector, any charities? Okay, it's probably about half. Okay, any I miss? I'm, always, I'm terrible at missing these things. Think of? No? <laughs> OK, accessibility specialists, it's like me. OK, about 15. OK, so it's a really great attendance today, by the way. Um, I think there's about 140 signed up, probably a little bit less in the room. But um, it's great to, to have you all here, good mix of people. So I hope you enjoy um, the time and the breaks for the networking. Uh, the agenda for today were pretty late uh, because I had massive trouble getting here today. Uh, but first talk up is Gavin Colburn who's going to be talking about assistive technology, past, present, and future. Uh, and then we'll have a break. I think the break today is probably going to be about 8 to, to 10 past 8, something like that. It depends. Um, but the break's going to be compressed today, sorry. So it's going to be 10 minutes at the most, I think. So just time to, to use the bathroom, get a quick drink, um, so we can try and get back on track for the second half. Um, oh, sorry, rest of the agenda. Um, second talk is Marion Foley and Kevin McLaughlin, um, who will be talking about designing for users with low vision. And then at the end, um, if you want, we'll go to a pub around the corner. Uh, it's called the Sir Christopher Hatton. Um, so we come out the door of Sainsbury's, uh, we turn left, and we walk for about a minute, and then we cross over the road, and, and the pub is pretty much there. It's a fairly quiet pub, so if you want to join uh, some of the organisers and other people from the meetup for a, for a chat, you want to find out a bit more stuff, ask some questions, please join us. Uh, quick thank you to all of our sponsors. So first of all, Sainsbury's, who provide the amazing venue that we get to use and some of the refreshments. Barclays, who have sponsored the meetup for the whole year. Um, so the money that Barclays give us allow us to do things like the live captions, and the live stream um, that is running at the minute. My Clear Text. So today we have uh, Heather from My Clear Text. Um, anyone not seen live captions before? OK, a few people maybe. Um, looks like mo most people have. So this is not software. This is uh, being done by Heather um, from My Clear Text. And then we have two guys uh, from Meetup Video at the back of the room who are running the live stream for us, and they'll help us with getting the videos up onto YouTube afterwards as well. So please just give a round of applause for all the people that support us to do this. <laughs> Last thing before we get started, um, if you're on the toilet, um, you come out of the doors here and take a left. And then just before you get to the stairs, the gents are on the left and the ladies are on the right. Um, please don't leave any litter in the room, so the room is always really clean when we come in. Um, so please, let's leave it the same. Uh, there's no planned fire drills, so if the alarm goes, we need to leave in an orderly fashion. Again, we go out the doors here, take a left, head up towards um, the stairs, and then there's a staircase on the left and the right, and that will take us back up to the foyer. Okay, so let's begin. I'm going to switch over to Gavin's laptop, which hopefully goes smoothly. Okay, mate. Thanks, Andy. Hi. 
Can you hear me okay? I'm Gavin from Little Forest. Okay. Evening. Hi. Um, so this is about my third or fourth meetup uh, for the accessibility. And I'm loving it. So a lot of what I've learned uh, so far in this room, uh, I'm playing back some of it today as well. Um, quite inspired by a lot of the things I've, I've learned here. So thank you to, to Andy and to everyone who set this up. Um, so what we're going to go through today is um, some assistive technology. So uh, why assistive technology is important, what it is. And I'm going to have a look at a bit of a history as well. Um, so go back through some of uh, the timeline of uh, some of the great technologies that have been invented to help people. Um, and we're still using many of them today. So we'll then go to the kind of practical side where we'll look more at the digital accessibility and some of the things that you need to do at the moment in terms of accessibility policies and so forth. And then to, to finish off, we'll look at the future, what are the exciting things that are happening now and people are working on to, to help everyone uh, going forward. Um, so assistive technology is very simply uh, any device or system that improves someone uh, who has a uh, disability in their everyday life. Um, so it can be extended even to a service as well. It can be something very simple, um, like you know, uh, some sort of signing mechanism, or it could also be something very complex, like computer software, computer hardware. Um, why accessibility? So the three kind of primary drivers. The first is really to improve the lives of people. Um, the second very common motivation is it creates a much larger audience. So there's economic factors that are creating benefits for organizations. And the third one is um, to really avoid lawsuits, bad press, et cetera. And this is really the regulatory angle now. Um, the accessibility is becoming very, very hot in lots of countries because of this uh, regulatory drive. Um, so the, there's an interesting kind of case, which is to say that everyone will, at some point in their life, have a disability of some kind. And if we have a look at this, uh, for example, this lady, uh, a large proportion of people will at one point or another become pregnant. And whilst being pregnant, they have a form of disability in that they can't uh, get on with their lives how they did previous to their pregnancy. And um, there's lots of reasons for that. Her mobility, the way she feels, um, all sorts of other parts of her body can be affected by that pregnancy. Um, uh, a case for all of us in terms of this is a bridge in Venice. Uh, it's quite a newly built bridge. And for some design reason, they decided to put steps in to this bridge. And you know, I think you can see what kind of challenges that causes for lots of people, even to go to tourists in terms of trying to get your suitcase up across this bridge. Now, actually, the solution that they had to put in place with this eventually after like a couple of years of problems was to put a a lift on the side of the bar, which cost like a couple of million or something, and took half an hour to get across the bridge. So it's like, <laughs> it would have been probably better to think about it from the beginning. Um, but it really is common. And you know, if we're fortunate enough, all of us will live many days and eventually become elderly. And uh, often with uh, older age, becomes challenges. Um, so disabilities of different types uh, that can happen. So. We need to be, to be mindful of that. Um, when uh, you're, you're a parent, you can often have buggies. Um, this is a, a form of a disability in terms of you need to get from one place to another. And you can have several uh, things blocking you, effectively. Um, this poor gentleman has to lug these heavy things upstairs all day. Uh, he's going to be uh, really happy when you make his life easy as well. And this lady. Uh, probably could have had some help or some advice on where she was going. So the interaction between her beautiful shoes and the cobblestones is actually causing uh, a challenge here for her. Um, so we all have some form of disability at some point in our life. Um, let's take a look now at the, at the timeline and, and kind of some fun things. Um, but an underlying thought about uh, disability and uh, how we can create solutions and why um, it's important to have solutions from a disability perspective is that from the challenge of, of where you are, if you're disabled, 
you will create a solution that is completely different from someone else solving a different challenge. And if we just think about that a little bit, so embracing the constraints creates a different kind of solution. And often that solution is very universal and is very usable by people who do not have that challenge. Um, so we'll look at several examples now. Um, Pellegrino Turi, who, uh, an Italian, um, back in 1802, our story is starting, uh, he was in love with Countess Carolina. Uh, Countess Carolina um, was blind, and um, uh, Turi was, was, going, was, was leaving the country and, and traveling, and they wanted a way to communicate, um, but in private. So uh, because she was blind, the only way that typically people did this was to uh, dictate a letter to a sighted person who would then write it and send it. Um, but she didn't want that. She wanted more privacy. And uh, they worked together and created the first typewriter. Um, so what's, um, what's kind of interesting here is that um, she could send a letter to him um, now, and, and he could read it, but then she couldn't read his letters back. So in a sense, it was a one-way communication. Um, this is an actual uh, letter that she typed up to him. Uh, now, if a few years later, 1829, Louis Braille was around, she then would have been able to uh, read his letters back. Um, so Louis was born sighted but had an accident in his father's workshop uh, in, in one of his eyes. Uh, that eye became infected and passed the infection to the other eye, and he was completely blind by the age of five. Um, his parents fortunately decided that he should still go to school and he would learn through listening. And because of that, he learned a great deal. And by the age of 15, he'd invented his six-dot system that was much simpler and much more powerful than anything that existed at the time. By the age of 20, he had actually published that system and it took off very quickly. Um, so this is obviously uh, an example of it. Um, we then go to 1876, Alexander Graham Bell and his wife, Mabel. Um, Alexander was born into a family of elocutionists. His father and his grandfather both worked with uh, people who were hard of hearing. And actually, Alexander's mother, um, by the age of 12, uh, for, for, for Alexander's age, was deaf. And he used to communicate with her. He learned how to communicate with her through this process of <clears throat> talking very closely to her forehead and also through, through uh, tapping on the table when there was a sort of a family dinner or something, he, would, he, he formed a language with her. Um, there's a lot of folklore that sort of says that a lot of what drove his innovation and his uh, telecommunication experiments was to assist his wife. And to, she was um, deaf uh, from, I think, the age of five through an illness. And um, she, she didn't hear ever, but obviously he invented the telephone and um, yeah, an incredible, uh, incredible achievement in, in terms of communication. Um, so this is actually not a question. This is my most loved assistive technology, and I hope maybe several of you like this as well, uh, the uh, guide dog. Um, so gorgeous puppy, uh, 1927. A lady called uh, Dorothy Utis was working in Switzerland. Um, she was training dogs for the army. And she realized that actually these dogs could probably help blind people as well. And she put an advert in a newspaper in America that got found out by uh, a gentleman called Morris Frank, who contacted her and then flew to Switzerland and started working with her for several months with what would become the first guide dog, whose name was Buddy. And uh, from there, they took that to America. At basically exactly the same time, there were two ladies in the UK who started the Guide Dog Society of the UK that's still going today and is obviously hugely successful. Guide Dog Societies around the world, uh, all over. Um, fast forward now to much more modern day, uh, Vince Cerf and his wife, Sigrid. Um, Vince was one of the three people working on the team, and he created the TCPIP a communication protocol, which is how all computers talk to each other. And he also worked on the first uh, commercial email uh, software. So he um, was hard of hearing from, from a very young age, and his wife, Sigrid, was deaf. And um, in order to help communication amongst his family, 
he believed that email would actually really help, and obviously it, it has. Um, there's a lovely story of how um, when she was 58, she had an implant into her ear, and they had the first conversation in their 33-year marriage over the telephone and could hear each other. Um, so lovely stories of, of how um, people with challenges have created incredible technologies that have much broader uh, use cases for everyone in life. Um, but now today, to look at the kind of practical side, uh, we're going to focus more on, on digital accessibility and, and websites and the, uh, the factor of law and compliance. And I'm sure many of you know this, the UK Equalities Act, uh, the timeline quite kind of daunting for a lot of organisations, I think. Um, so basically of September this year, I think any new public sector website um, has to be accessible um, and compliant with the WCAG 2.1 standard. Um, as of September next year, all existing public websites have to be accessible and uh, with that standard. And then by June 2021, all mobile applications also to be accessible. Um, which is incredibly uh, ambitious and creates a lot of work, uh, which is, is good. It's very much the same story in the European Union, uh, in the US, and <clears throat> in pretty much every major market, so Australia. There's a great resource from W3, um, which actually, if, you, if your organization needs to operate in, uh, operates in multi-markets, um, this gives you uh, what the guidelines are in terms of the law in each of those markets. It's a fantastic uh, resource to, to look up. Just look up the W3 um, multinational, international law. Um, so uh, another resource I wanted to show you quickly was the accessibility statement. So an accessibility statement um, is really intended to communicate uh, how accessible your website is um, and where there are areas that you need to improve. Um, so the government, uh, the digitalgov.co.uk, is, uh, is here tonight actually uh, talking after this. And there's an amazing resource from here, which is the uh, accessi example accessibility statement. So I'm just going to click here and go to that. Um, and what this does is you can, you can actually put in the name of your organization. And this gives you a boilerplate to, uh, to use to benchmark your existing accessibility statement against or to use um, Perota and fill in. And that's great. I think it's uh, amazing how, how good the, the government is from a digital perspective, um, particularly in accessibility. So it does things like uh, you should explain what, uh, what is good and what is accessible about the website. Can you do things like um, you know, increase fonts, change color contrasts, um, can you navigate using your keyboard? Um, so you should call these sort of things out in your accessibility policy. Um, you should also then um, indicate which areas of the website are not accessible. So you might have, say, your news section uh, is, is really out of date and really needs an upgrade to be accessible. You should call that out in, in, in this uh, policy. Um, you should advise people on what they can do if they can't access information on your website as well. So that's you know, who to contact. Uh, in that case, and also um, who to report any accessibility problems they have with their website. Um, so then also you should indicate, uh, if you're a public sector, who your governing body is, and uh, more sort of contact information. Then there's a technical piece around kind of compliance uh, with the WCAG guidelines, and that's almost a blow-by-blow -blow piece. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> okay, so. The next resource that kind of follows on really nicely from that is from Nemensa, and it's called the Accessibility Statement Generator. Um, and that basically, if you Google that and you just do start generating, so here it is now, and all you need to do is fill in your website name, your website URL, choose your level of uh, accessibility compliance in terms of single A, double A, triple A. Um, Put in the contact details that are going to be generated into your accessibility policy. Um, and then, um, you in order to fill in the next section, you need to have an audit done. So you need to have uh, maybe a software audit uh, with a manual audit to understand what the level of accessibility is for this website that you're creating the accessibility policy for. 
Uh, the lovely thing with this wizard is I can go, okay, I do not comply with 121, so I don't have alternatives for time-based media. It then gives me a little section to say, what is my plan for addressing this issue? And I can say, uh, we are upgrading um, in 2020, for example. And I can go through all of the guidelines and unselect if I'm not compliant, uh, explain a little bit. You need to be careful with timelines, obviously, they set expectations, but really you want to be giving some clear guidance here. Um, and this is really helpful to be transparent about what your plan is um, and how you are uh, getting your organization more accessible. You then can continue and you're asked if you want to save and you fill in your details. And then you can copy and paste that to your website, basically. Um, now, in order to get to that level of detail, you have to have an accessibility audit. So, uh, let's talk a little bit. Who here has had an accessibility audit done on their website? Wow. Okay. So, not that many, actually. Uh, okay. Um, so, accessibility audits. Right. So, the benefits of having an audit. One, um, you're going to learn uh, a lot about accessibility, which is brilliant. Your organization and your team is going to learn a lot. Uh, you're going to understand exactly where you are today in terms of the service you provide. And if you then do regular uh, audits, which is definitely advisable and, and recommended, uh, something like monthly or, or something of that frequency, you can then plot your progress over time. Uh, that's really essential. Um, by having the audits done, you also then are showing that your organization is taking accessibility seriously. Um, so how to do an audit? There are two flavors. Um, I think it's really helpful to start with an automated test, so using automated software that will go through, because most websites nowadays are really large, um, you very quickly in a matter of a few hours will get a report that will tell you exactly which pages have errors, uh, which are fully compliant, and so forth, and you can get a flavor for where you are very quickly. You have to have manual testing done after that. You have to decide on uh, what are the personas you want to test for, and you, you can't just rely on automated testing. So uh, I'm going to ask another question here. Um, how much coverage do you think automated software can do these days um, in terms of telling you everything there is about accessibility uh, compliance? So I'm going to say, who thinks that you can get everything, 100% from an accessibility audit uh, from, from a computer? No one thinks 100%. Okay, who thinks 80%? It'll tell you 80% accuracy. 80% accuracy. Okay, who thinks 50% accuracy? Okay, M uh, more people, quite a few people. Who thinks 30%? Who thinks less? Okay, uh, the answer I'm going to give here is, is controversial because it's, it's, it's basically 30%. Roughly. It does. So, well done. I'm also surprised no one said 100% because I probably would have said that recently. Um, so um, it's essential to have manual testing for lots of reasons, but that's the easiest to understand, I think, that the software, which is as good as it is, can only tell you about a third of the issues that are actually present. And this is what an automated test typically kind of looks like. Um, you will get a lot, so it's a nightmare if you're a digital officer getting an accessibility audit, you get a huge number like 11,303, and you go, that's how many errors I got, okay, I'll just go home. Um, everyone gets that, basically. The key thing is, when you then start to dig into the detail, that in my experience, most accessibility problems at a code level are tiny. They're like, oh wow, okay, I can fix that in three seconds. The key thing also is that with that small problem, when you fix it, it's often the pages use the template, you roll out the template fix, and suddenly you fix a thousand pages in, in one go with that issue. So you see those numbers go down really quickly as well. And you see that improvement, and um, that's great for everyone. That, that, that helps you to feel the progress, and that's really important. Again, just a bit more about how there are many categories, so the, the guidelines get categorized into uh, the framework provided by WCAG. And one of the key things, because everyone will have a lot of issues on their, on their sites, typically, when you start out, uh, you want to look at what are the unique errors. Um, so in this case, 
there are 25 unique errors across all of the websites. And the most common error is the top one, it's on 530 pages. So if I fix this guideline, I'm going to fix 530 instances. If I fix the next one down, and I, so I start from really the big problem and, and chew away, and I'm going to see a lot more progress and, and get compliant much quicker. Because there is a lot of planning and a lot of work uh, that, that goes into this. This is how a page audit may look. So the areas that are in green are showing that the contrast is good, the headings are good, um, maybe that the image has um, alt text. Um, if those are in red, it means that you need to do some minor modifications to the code to make them compliant. Um, okay, so that's how much. Okay, so maybe 30% depends. So yeah, it's essential to test uh, from people with people. Another brilliant resource from the government is personas for accessibility. Um, for example, so you can download these and use them in your team to understand who your audience is. Um, for example, uh, there's Ashley, she's partially sighted and she uses a screen reader. There's Christopher uh, who has rheumatoid arthritis and you have several different personas to, to work for and it really brings things to life and, and, and helps from, uh, from, from your planning and from your understanding and from your education. Um, there's also a critical checklist describing really what are the big hitters in terms of if you fix these things, your site's going to be much better. So things like um, you know, keyboard accessibility, um, keyboard traps. Um, also from GovUK, lovely posters that you can have printed out and, and put around and lots of brilliant education, do's and don'ts of um, how to design for people with different types of disabilities, dyslexia, um, whatever it is. Um, so have a look at these resources. Um, I think it's amazing and, and it's something to be very proud of. Um, okay, so quickly, how to build sites the best way. The terminology used is progressive enhancement. All that means is make your pages as simple as you can. So the less code you need, um, the better. And if you then need to do or want to do something that is more complicated and has different functionality, then you know, make sure that that's accessible on as many devices as possible. Um, but with that baseline, uh, keep it really simple. Um, a nice uh, quote here, basically, the progressive enhancement is about uh, as much about as resilience as it is about inclusiveness. That's because if you make something simple, that functions, it's going to function in more places at more times than if you start to make it move and dance and, and whistle and all sorts. Um, okay, so now uh, that's all the practical today's stuff in terms of uh, digital. Let's look at tomorrow's world. Um, what people are working on at the moment, there's some amazing, amazing pieces um, in terms of assistive. Has anyone heard of Be My Eyes? I think I learned about it here. <laughs> Brilliant, amazing. For those who haven't heard about it, it's an app that um, you can sign up for as a sighted person and a person who needs assistance with low vision can uh, request it through the app. If you then get a message and, and accept it, you can then guide them using their camera and answer their questions. Um, just incredible. Um, this is a, a company that I've met recently at a, another event called Recite. They create a toolbar that works on pretty much any website that will then um, help you to understand the content that makes it more accessible. Um, that's a great uh, tech. Uh, Microsoft um, and Apple and Google, so brilliant in, in this accessibility world. Um, seeing AI, um, I know the RNIB also have a very similar product, which is really amazing. It does very different things, but, but in a similar sort of way of using the camera. So seeing AI will do things like recognize people you know, tell you how far away they are from you. It will uh, look at currency, tell you what the currency is and what the denomination is. It understands barcodes, um, all sorts of you know, very clever stuff. This is just out from Alexa. I believe the new Alexa will have a camera in it and uh, it allows people to, it will tell you, so Alexa, what am I holding? And she will then say, um, it's a tin of tomatoes. Um, so incredible independence uh, if you're cooking in the kitchen. Uh, for example. Um, Kin Trans is uh, 
for signing. So um, basically real-time um, multilingual sign language translator. So I don't speak sign. Uh, it will turn it into text for me uh, to understand. Um, Ava is another mobile app. So if a hard of hearing person is in an environment, say a business meeting um, around a table, uh, the people at the table can install Ava. Um, and as they're talking, Ava will uh, do a speech to text, put their name next to what they're saying. And the person who's hard of hearing can then follow much easier. I'm trying to lip read and, and other things in terms of uh, a busy, noisy uh, environment, which is very fast moving, is very difficult. And it's amazing uh, that there's an idea like that. Um, in light, they place little beacons. So they work in places like hotels and public spaces. Um, when you walk into this uh, public space, it will give you information about what is there. Uh, where is the reception? Uh, where's the lounge? Where's the conference that you're going to? So using the application, um, uh, hotels and venues can tailor the information for people. Um, Wayfinder is similar, but is working more sort of slightly more outdoors. It's a UK organization. They're creating a, an open standard for wayfinding. Um, so they're working with uh, the Transport for London and um, yeah, doing brilliant work so you can understand what is, what is happening in the station and to help guide people through uh, a, a busy train station. Um, in terms of um, color blindness, incredible progress here. So Enchroma is one of, of several brands who've created devices like glasses that really um, help people to, to see colors in a, in, a, in a better way for them. Um, this I love. Uh, some museums have done 3D uh, printing and taken paintings so that people can actually experience what the painting is like by touching it. Um, the, the whole 3D printing area is incredible. It really is. Um, speaking of 3D printing, Newcastle University 3D printed the world's first human cornea. So really, uh, it's a very difficult to get corneas, I believe. Um, so it's amazing progress that's happening there. Has anyone been to Dan Lanois? You've got to go. OK, not very many people at all. Few, small handful, few more maybe. OK, amazing experience. Um, if you love food, uh, if you love having a good time, if you love learning, can't recommend it enough. There's one here in London, just up the road, in Farringdon, is it? Um, and there's one in Paris, if you want to go there. Um, and it's a great organization who run it. Um, you will have a brilliant time. That's what I really recommend going there. Um, Dyslexi, a Dutch organization, um, Christian Boer, has created a font for dyslexic people to help uh, with that, make it clearer, more readable. Uh, all sorts of little tricks, like basically creating a heavy bottom to the font so it, it's weighted. Um, uh, yeah, inclining the letters, so Bs and Ds, which are often uh, mixed around, by inclining them more, you, they're more contrasting to each other, so less likely to be muddled up. Um, enlarging the openings uh, makes things clearer. Um, and lots and lots of techniques like this. You can download this font, you can install it on you know, your website or wherever you need to, to, to help people. Um, lovely idea. Um, this is great, Kangaroo Cars. It's uh, founder, uh, Stacey Zoom. Um, she uh, struggles with muscular atrophy, and yeah, you can see what it does. It's ingeniously simple and clever. This not so clever. Who knows about Domino's? Yeah, okay. Um, I think as of last week. So what Domino's decides, so a blind person sued Domino's maybe a couple of years ago. I'm not quite sure of the timeline. And for some reason, uh, Domino's decided to counter sue and say that they didn't need to make their website accessible. This is in the US. And uh, they took it to the appeal to the Supreme Court and I think just last week, basically, the Supreme Court have refused to hear the case uh, based on the, the, the evidence that's presented, which is an incredible win for accessibility. Um, but also, the questions in my head are like, why, why, Domino's, would you do this? Why would you 
I don't, I just don't see the, the upside here at all. Um, people have calculated that it might cost thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to make the website accessible. The legal fees alone would be ten times that of what they've paid. So, you know, um, this is. I'm hoping Domino's are now going to really turn full circle on that. Um, Starbucks, on the other hand, doing an incredible job. Uh, an entire team of people who sign um, in in one location. So you you can go into that um, into Starbucks and the whole team is trained and they're rolling that out across, uh, across the US. Um, in terms of helping uh, in other ways, Reemploy um, is a recruiting agent who specializes in disabled people. Um, one of the ways to help with accessibility and what, what you need is really people who understand the disability. Um, a great organization to work with. The Carter Center, um, they have been working on curing river blindness in South America. They also now, so river blindness affects, you know, yeah, about 30 odd million people worldwide. It's a parasite that is, gets into the blood and is transmitted from one person to another. And it's hu a huge problem in South America and parts of Africa. So they're now aiming to cure the 30 million people, I think it is in Nigeria, who have uh, river blindness because there is a drug that has been donated for free. Um, I'm bringing drugs in there because I, I see drugs as technology as well nowadays, so it's assistive. Um, this is uh, Cure Blindness, uh, the Himalayan Cataract Project. They have several projects. I can struggle to think of a better way to spend $25. Uh, uh, donation of $25, they have a team of fully trained, fully vetted um, eye surgeons who then perform the cataract operation and actually really restore people's sight um, in those countries. Um, lovely organization. Um, and this is, um, this is I think my, my final slide. Uh, there's a lady um, from Firefly. Uh, I'll let her tell the story, but it's really joining at full circle in terms of uh, we looked at Alexander Graham Bell and Turi um, and Louis Braille and the work that she's doing I think is really showing um, continuing that, that timeline. Rotem was our second child and he was born with cerebral palsy. He cried almost the entire first year. And one day his physical therapist looked at us and said, your child doesn't know what his legs are. So I cried probably the first week or two and, <laughs> and started to walk him. It's very hard to walk a two-year-old because you're down on your hands and knees practically onto the floor. I said, there has to be a better way. I made shoes out of wood. I tried different kinds of connections until I got to the first version of the UPSI. My hope is it will be used all over the world to give our children a better childhood. So, incredible success story. Um, there are something like 27 million people uh, with uh, cerebral palsy um, in the world. Um, this. The uh, device that she's created is selling really well and it's, it's a huge success and I think it's, it's, a, it's an amazing achievement for someone to show with, with no real background in it and just a need uh, to create something fantastic like that. Um, yeah, finally what can we all do to help? So really, um, you know, improve the accessibility of your sites in terms of most of us are, I think are in terms of the digital space. Um, Build accessibility into the workflow because it is an ongoing thing and it needs to just become part of the standard. Um, have your products and services reviewed by accessibility experts um, and consider hiring people with disabilities to help. Um, another key thing is when you notice maybe your, one of your local restaurants or some service nearby is to compliment them if you see that they have become more accessible in some way or another. I think that's really key. Um, I'm Gavin Colburn from Little Forest. Uh, thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you, Andy.
Thank you. Gavin, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. I certainly learned a whole lot, particularly in the second half, all the, all the new stuff. There's lots of things that I wasn't aware of, so thank you. Amazing. Um, because we're running a bit behind schedule, we're going to save the Q&A for hopefully the end of the second talk. Um, so there are a few questions in Slido, and I'm sure there's some in the audience, but we're going to try and save them up for the end if we can. If we don't have time, then we can do them online, I guess. Yep. You've got yeah. ways to contact you. So there's a couple of interesting ones in the Slido that I have some thoughts on as well, but we'll try and save them for the end. Uh, Heather, how long do you need for a break? Five minutes. I think you need a bit longer than that. <laughs> all that always tells me it's, it's half an hour, it's half an hour. Come on, how long do you need? 15? We would normally start at quarter past eight. If we do that, then we're back on track. Okay, quarter past eight. Qu quarter past eight. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary.
I'll just could do a quick introduction for you both. Uh, okay, welcome back, everyone. I um, hope you managed to get uh, a drink, some more pizza. For the record, all the pizza you eat at our events now is not from Domino's anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as all that SHIT hit, we switched our order to someone else um, so they don't get our money anymore. So um, second talk today is Marion Foley and Kevin McLaughlin from GDS. Government Digital Service. I'm going to hand straight over to you, to you both. Um, we're going to talk to you today about designing for users with low vision. Um, and when I talk about low vision, I mean vision that can't be corrected with corrective lenses, so um, glasses and contact lenses can't fix it. Um, and just, I would like to start with a show of hands. Um, just a caveat, Andy is going to look at this for me because I won't be able to see your hands. Um, please, can you raise your hand if you work with somebody who has low vision? And keep your hands raised. Um, and could you also raise your hand if you have a friend or family member who has low vision? Probably about doubled, I would say. So probably so about, about 25 and then about 50 second time around. Okay, okay, thank you. That just helps me kind of gauge um, <coughs> awareness. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about two uh, the main things when you're thinking about low vision. Um, one of the first things is per acuity. So that's things like clarity, sharpness of someone's vision. You know, so it could be someone could have blurry vision at the different levels and degrees, um, contrast, those kinds of things. And also, the so the other um, aspect of low vision is um, your visual field. So your visual field is how much around you you can see. Um, Kevin, can you hold that? Sorry. Um, so as I understand it, most people can see their fingers when they're moving about here. I can see my fingers when they're moving about here. Um, my loss of visual field is my peripheral vision. Um, loss of visual field could also mean loss of central vision. It could mean you've lost the top half of your vision, the lower half, um, any part of your visual field. So um, every day, 250 people in the UK uh, will lose their sight. Um, uh, over 2 million people in the UK live with sight loss every day. Uh, sorry, live with sight, yeah, yeah every day. Um, and 360,000 people are severely sight impaired 
or sight impaired. Now, that previously would have been referred to as somebody who's blind or partially sighted. And blind doesn't necessarily, as has been mentioned already, it doesn't mean that you have lost all of your sight. You might have just very, very poor sight. So uh, personally myself, I'm registered blind, but I have got some sight. Um, for me, my condition is called oculocutaneous albinism with this nystagmus. So for me, the things that are annoying are bright lights like that, but thankfully they've reduced them, so that's good, because I have photophobia. Um, depth of field, so I'm not a big fan of steps, especially not falling down them, so uh, some lighting on them is quite nice. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the main aspects of how you know, my vision is impacted with uh, my disability. Um, and my disability, um, I'm also registered blind. I have uh, an autoimmune condition that likes to attack my optic nerves. But the upshot of that is I have severely reduced visual field. My central vision is really, really grainy. My colour vision is very washed out and I've got no uh, depth perception at all. Um, so it's, um, it's always a race between us to see who's going to fall downstairs first. <laughs> you nearly always won. I usually, I usually win. <laughs> so, um, so some people don't use assistive tech. It's really interesting that, you know, we've, we've had a talk about assistive technology um, just before and some of the, the, the things that are happening with assistive tech and some of the future, which is, is really, really good and really interesting. But you're not born an expert, you know, you don't, there's no manual for assistive technology if you develop a disability, if you're born with a disability. So you have to learn how to use that equipment. And in fact, Marion, I think you had an interesting experience. Yeah, so an occupational health professional once said to me, oh, can the doctor not help you with how to use uh, magnification software? That's not their job. <laughs> um, but there's kind of... There's no one whose job that is. Every person who develops a disability has to go on that journey and has to do that learning <coughs> themselves. Um, but there's a lot of ways you can help us. So we're going to start with this slightly odd example, um, which is essentially a wall of text. Um, this is something that we use as an example on gov.uk a lot. Um, and we simplify it to this. Now, your user with low vision has an awful lot of extra cognitive load. Their eyes might be trying to overcorrect things. I think, Kevin, you've got a good example. Yeah, so for nystagmus, my, my brain is doing a lot of work to correct my vision. Now, it's luckily for me, uh, luckily I say, but luckily for me, because I was born with uh, my eye condition, my brain has always been doing that job and working on it, but it is extra cognitive load for my brain to do that work. So, you know, for any, anyone with a visual impairment, I think overloading them with information that they don't need, and if you can convey that more simply, then convey it more simply. Yeah, so for me, all reading is eye strain. Everything I look at is eye strain, and I'm sure that's the same for a lot of conditions. So if I have to read six lines of text or two and a half lines of text, I'm going to choose the two and a half lines. So if your website has six lines of text and a competitor's website has two and a half lines of text, bye-bye. Um, Another good example here. So uh, lo lots of content here, but I think the uh, I mean, I'm not going to stay on this for too long, but the... Um, the big issue here is things like italics used in this, underlining, bold, and they work sometimes, but not in mid-sentence and mid-content like this, and, and something like this is much, much better, so using bullet points, and Martin, you can talk so a little bit more about that. Bold, underline, and italics are meant to slow people down, they're meant to draw attention. If you use that all the time and you pepper your text with it, people are going to read really, really slowly. And if someone has an impairment or a disability, um, you're going to lose that user really, really quickly. So rewriting stuff so it's really simple, um, it has structure, and it follows the F reading pattern. And the F reading pattern is, um, there's a lot of resources on the web about this, people tend to read more at the top of the page and down the left-hand side of the page um, in an F pattern. So if you can follow that, you're more likely to engage your user. So the do's kind of for this, this section. Um, I so we, um, 
we've covered some of these already, but we'll go just go over them again. So write simply and clearly. But that makes sense for every user because if you're providing content that's simple, you know, people don't want to sit there for ages and have to process information. They just want to get the message. So to get your message across, you want that to be clear. Um, and breaking up blocks of text, uh, I mean, nothing more than probably 25 um, words per sentence, maybe? Yeah. No more than that. And, you know, you know just keeping it, keeping it like that just means it's easier for a user to digest, but especially a user who may have visual impairment and is struggling to find what they're looking for and, and that content. Um, we've already mentioned avoiding italics and the obvious reasons Martin's explained that and following the F pattern. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about magnification. Um, so it's like, uh, so magnification software, browser zoom, and low resolution. Marion will talk about that because she's an expert on that as a user. So um, these are good things that if, if you have access, you won't have access to all of these, but if you can get access to some of them, they're really, really good to build your empathy with your users with low vision if you can test some of these. So things like Zoom text is probably the most common piece of paid for software that someone with a visual impairment who uses magnification software would use. I personally use Zoom text. Um, I also use the second one on my list, which is uh, the accessibility Zoom function, uh, which is built into the operating system on Apple Mac uh, computers. Um, and that's really, really good. Uh, you d it does suffer a little bit from the resolution um, when you zoom in can be affected slightly, so seeing images and things get, gets a lot more difficult. Um, but that's free, and that's something you can easily test if you've got access to the Mac OS. Um, Magnifier on Windows 10 is another free one built into the OS. Um, it's worth you know, playing around with that, having a, a, a little go at yourself and see how, just, just empathize with how the user is seeing your content or using your website. Um, to get a better understanding of some of the barriers that you may be placing, not intentionally, but you know you may be placing barriers in their way. But if, and if you consider those things and, and using this kind of magnification software, then you're going to understand that a little bit better. Um, on Chromebook, uh, they have a zoom functionality, which is using the Control Alt and the brightness buttons. Um, I personally don't use a Chromebook, but I've seen this demonstrated, and it looks quite good. It's very similar to. Uh, the functionality on the MacBooks and uh, Apple uh, OS. And the most common one, which I'm sure most people in the room has probably used, is browser zoom. So that's just increasing the everything, the size of everything on the browser itself. And that's like a, a really useful one to use. And uh, you know, and, and just understand that when you increase the browser size, what content or what functionality will somebody miss out on if, if, you, don't, um, if you don't design for that. Um, so here are a couple of examples of, I suppose these are components that I've encountered whenever I've been browsing quite often. So mega menus can be quite difficult for me to use. And the reason is, is because I only see a small portion of the screen when I'm zoomed in. So for example, if I go into a mega menu, um, I can quite easily, with my pointer, go to the edge of that and then it disappears, and so I lose my space, have to go back to start again, and it's like a continuous circle of never find anything that I'm looking for. So frustrating, and I probably leave the website. Um, another thing is uh, data labels, and uh, same principle that, you know, if the, if the label, in this example here, I have got, I use a large mouse pointer too, so some of the information's obscured. If I move away from um, this, uh, bar here, I will lose uh, that label, um, and if I'm zoomed in, I can't see the edge of that a lot of the time, so it's, you just have to be really, really conscious and test in those sort of situations just to make sure that your users aren't experiencing that. Um, and, and carousels, uh, this again is really important. that I'm, me as a, as a visually impaired user who is using magnification, I can only see a small percentage of the screen when I'm zoomed in. So if I zoom into a carousel and the content's moving uh, and I have no control over that, then I just lose out on the option to uh, engage with uh, the, the product or service on that site. Um, and 
couple of ways on how to magnify on mobile devices. Uh, everyone carries mobile devices around, so you can practice with these. Personally, myself, I change, I don't use any of these. I change the settings on the phone itself. So I okay. use the largest possible fonts that I can on the phone. And I find lots and lots of problems with uh, apps that I use where the, the information's truncated, so I can't see labels completely because I'm using the, the largest font on the phone. Um, so you, you can test on the iPhone with uh, the double tap with three fingers. will uh, open the magnification, and you can have a go with that and see how you, what your experience is like uh, whenever you're, you're um, using an app. Uh, Android, triple tap magnification. I find it a little bit clunky. It is improving all of the time, but I find that a little bit slow when I try to use it, and that's why I found my own ways of dealing with that. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, browser zooming, the most common way. Okay, um, just as an aside, my phone is an 8-inch tablet um, with extra-large fonts. And yes, it looks like Trigger Happy TV. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about low resolution, which is what I use. Um, so just to explain, uh, your resolution on your uh, computer, your device that you're using, the higher it is, the sharper the image, but the smaller everything is. The lower it is, the fuzzier the image, but the bigger it is. Um, and I um, opt for big and fuzzy. Um, so I work with, um, basically I get the mobile view of most things on my screen. Um, just to caveat, these next screenshots, I don't want to pick on anybody, they are common problems that I encounter. These just happen to be really, really good examples of those common problems. Um, so as I mentioned, I usually get the mobile view of most sites on my desktop. Not this one. So um, if your site is responsively, desi responsively designed, I will get the mobile view. If it's not, I will probably get a view that doesn't actually fit on the screen properly and doesn't give me a scroll bar or an option to get to the right-hand edge. So I will never know how good your site is. Um, and I will leave it. Um, <laughs> next. So this one, um, this is a pop-up. We love pop-ups. Um, so all this, although this site gives me a scroll bar, the scroll bar does nothing for the pop-up. It, it won't move it. I can't get out of that pop-up without uh, decreasing the zoom in my browser to a point where I can't see the X. Um, so that, that site's completely unusable to me. Um, and this is just an example. This is how much I can see on my screen it, at one point. Um, at one moment in time. Now, if you cover your website with pop-ups and bubbles, you're obscuring a lot of the screen, which is already pretty tiny. Um, so I, I won't chat with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a few things to consider when you are designing. Um, how, so, uh, how does data, how do diagrams um, and PDFs look to the user when they can only see a tiny part of the screen at once? Um, so how do they look when you enlarge them? Do they pixelate? Uh, how much does the user need to see at once? So if they can only see that tiny portion, are they going to get the entirety of a data label? Or like in Kevin's example, are they going to get half of it? Um, and does the user have to scroll? And by that, I mean, so usually, responsibly designed sites will fit on my desktop view to the width, and the text will reflow to fit to the width of my page. And I will have to scroll up and down, but I won't have to scroll left to right. In a PDF, I have to scroll up and down and left to right to read it. So I have to zoom in to be able to see it. Then I have to read half a line, scroll over, read the other half of a line, scroll over again, start the process. It's, it's a bit boring and um, makes me a bit seasick. I think it's quite common as well that nowadays, you know, most people access uh, content on mobile devices. You know, it is over 60% of people accessing content. I believe it's 60, somebody can quote me on that, but I, I've heard recently it's around that. So if you're using PDFs, you're excluding, like, not just visually impaired users, you're excluding a massive, massive number of people who just can't be bothered. They try and zoom in and out on a small screen. So I guess, 
for me, because most websites, I get the mobile version, if you're testing for mobile, you're also testing for low resolution, and thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say something really controversial about alt text here. Uh, it's not very controversial. So notice this isn't in the screen reader section, um, because alt text, so for those of you that don't know, alt text is an alternative text attribute to an image um, could also be a diagram um, explaining what's in that image or diagram. Um, and that is available to screen readers. It is not available to users of magnification and zoom. So if you have to zoom in on an image so much that the image pixelates and you can't possibly interpret the image, you don't get the information on what's in the image unless it's in the body text. Explain what's in that image or in that diagram in the body text, please makes my life a lot easier. Um, so the do is for us. Apply responsive web design. It makes the world a better place. Use callouts for important info. It helps us kind of notice stuff. We have a lot of cognitive load already. Reading hurts. Um, if you really need us to read something, make it very obvious. Good use good contrasts and font sizes. Um, that should be your default. Um, I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, publish information as HTML. So keep users on your web pages. Use a linear logical layout. Give something structure so it's easy to navigate and digest. Give interactions context so we can make sense of them. And describe diagrams and images in body text. I'm going to talk a little bit about different colors here. So some people don't see the same colors that you do. There's a bigger existential question here about do we all see the same red? But, but genuinely, color blindness doesn't just mean not seeing colors. It usually means seeing different colors from the ones that are sort of standard. Um, and people could be using different color schemes to help with that. This is my particular preferred color scheme. Designs, the design system on gov.uk tested with it. That was great. Um, I loved it. Um, this, for me, <coughs> reduces glare. I don't deal well with black and white and with the glare that comes off a white screen. Um, other people could be using different color uh, schemes as well for different impairments, different disabilities. Dyslexics often use a different color scheme. It might help someone with autism. Um, but your defaults should always be WCAG 2.1 compliant um, and use a good color contrast. Gray text on a gray background was never a good idea. <laughs> um, so this next slide, uh, it's two depictions of the same thing. Um, the right hand image, the blobs are um, as if someone has red green color blindness. So um, the Red and green dots on the left-hand image are now green and green dots. Um, and it's not clear which ones are the more important um, or whether this is indicating some kind of scoring system. Um, the person seeing the right-hand image isn't going to understand it at all. Um, don't just rely on color to convey information. You should be using a mixture of color and shapes and text to convey um, anything important. Um, and this next slide is in all my presentations. Oh, your favorite? <laughs> It is your favorite, it is isn't it? It's my favorite slide. That's just that's the only reason it's here. Um, <laughs> what 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 should people use instead of your favorite um, pie chart? So um, pie charts and performance analysts will tell you the same. Pie isn't for everyone, but pie is never the best way of representing data. So simple bar charts um, with a simple color scheme are the easiest thing for everyone to digest. Um, We've got a whole other presentation on that, and we haven't got time to go into it. No, we haven't. Um, <laughs> so the do's for this, use good color contrasts um, as your default, um, but set those defaults. Those are your defaults. People can tweak the defaults, um, and remember that they might be using different colors from what you expect. Um, use a combination of color, shapes, and text to convey information. Um, and again, put buttons and notifications in context. Um, to give people clues to what they do. Certainly don't just use color for buttons. Um, we might press the wrong one. Uh, there are some codes. I think that, that's quite dangerous if someone presses the wrong color. Um, I'm going to hand over to yep. Kevin. And I'm going to have uh, 
<coughs> a few things to say about screen readers. Now, I will caveat this with I am not an expert with screen readers. I do not use them. I have some experience. Um, but it's really, really important to think about um, users who are screen reader users. I've got some examples here of content that's not very good uh, if you're a screen reader user. So for instance, this one, uh, if you can see it, what's happening is it's skipping over the categories section. So really this is um, somebody should access this with a keyboard. So a screen reader user will access with a keyboard. And if they can't focus on this categories, you've excluded them from a big section of content. So you have to test for that sort of thing and make sure you're not excluding some of your users by testing. And you'd be excluding more than uh, someone with a visual impairment. You'd be ex excluding other users. Um, another example is uh, labels are a bit of a nightmare. So um, links. So in this example, we have got lots and lots of links which use the same uh, the same text, so more info. Now, a screen reader user can call up all of the links as a, as, as a table almost, so they can click through. Now, if they're all named the same, more info, that's not very helpful. I mean, you really want to be telling your user uh, what the prize is at the end of that little link. Is that, is that what I was supposed to say? Yes. Something? Yeah, yes, okay. Uh, so, Give you know, hand. so really, really, really think about, uh, really think about that. But, I mean, that's important because it's easy just to think more info or find out more. I want to find, you know, give me a clue and sort of entice me to find out more. Um, if I can get this to move on. Uh, so we've, we've covered some of this already and it's really, you know, it's quite, it is quite logical actually. So following the linear logical layout to help screen reader users navigate. Just think about your user. If you focus on your user and their needs, and you also do your testing with users with those needs, then you will learn a lot and uh, you'll improve your product, your service, your website, whatever you're building will be magnificent compared to the competition. Um, Marion, you want to, do you want to talk about skipping yeah, heading so levels? Heading levels. Um, so screen reader users can also navigate with a list of headings. Um, it's really important that your heading levels are nested properly. So an H2 should always be followed by an H3. It shouldn't skip straight to an H4 because a screen reader user might be trying to navigate around to find that missing H3. They might think, oh, I've missed it because it's coded wrongly. Where is it? Um, and they might waste a load of time trying to find that or they might just give up and leave your website. Um, so the next one, I've kind of touched on this already. Publish everything in HTML, keep users on your website. So a user um, using whatever assistive technology or not has already learned to navigate your website. That, that was, you know, they've already ma made that effort. Keep them there. If you ask them to download an attachment, which they then have to learn to navigate using their assistive technology, that's a whole lot of extra cognitive load that they didn't really want. Um, and you're very likely to use your loser, uh, lose your user at that point. <laughs> Not the other one, sorry. <laughs> it's funny the other one. <laughs> um, so the do's here. Um, we haven't touched in on all of these because we haven't had time in this presentation. We've probably already overrun. Um, but there's loads of resources out, out there on the web, so do go and look. Um, provide audio description transcripts and captions for video. Follow a linear logical layout. Build for keyboard only use. Write descriptive links and headings to give your users that clue and that reason to visit your link. Um, and avoid referring to locations on a page. Um, so for uh, someone using a desktop, the locations of, say, a sidebar on the right will be very different from how they will look on a mobile where the sidebar might actually appear underneath all the content. But for someone who can't see the site at all, that location is um, useless. Uh, so, any questions, if we have time? Yep, you have 10 minutes. <sighs> okay. There's quite a few in Slido. Uh, okay. So I'll give you all from Slido, and then if anyone has any in the room, just put your hand up and I'll bring you a mic.
Okay, how can we help public sector web managers avoid using disproportionate burden as a reason if they fall shy of the new accessibility regulations? Send them to GDS. Yeah. Some of the GDS. <laughs> we, prob we probably can't answer that, can we? We really? probably we, we, we can't answer Definitely that. Definitely can't answer that. Um, yeah, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but no I, I would encourage you to ask that question directly to GDS, and we can ask the accessibility team with, for a definitive answer. Okay. Uh, what do you think of blocks of centred text? <sighs> Please don't. Um, yeah, just don't do it. Don't go there. So I mean, no one likes those, do they, really? I mean, who, who really likes a massive block of text to so read? So, for someone <laughs> who's zooming in, we start on the top left. Um, so, I would say the same thing as I say for, for navigation menus are, are buried on the top right. It's going to take me ages to find that. If your text is in the middle, um, for someone that's zoomed in, they're starting on the top left. They're going to then scan across to the right and if your text isn't even at the top and centered, if it's like in the middle of the page and centered, it's going to be ages before they find it and they'll, they'll, just, they'll give up. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on in website text resizing and color contrast tools? So I think you mentioned one of these, didn't you, Gavin? Um, is it Recite, was it? Uh, yes, Recite is the toolbar. Yeah. yeah. I think they can, so in my experience, I'm not talking about Recite because um, I haven't used it, but my experience when websites have widgets for altering text size and color contrast, they invariably go wrong. And at some point, when you've navigated to, say, your fourth or fifth page, you have to press those again. Whereas if you do what I do and you change the scaling in your browser to change the text size of all websites and you use a, an extension to change your color colors, then that does it to all websites regardless, um, and you don't need any widgets or fancy toolbars. I think another difficulty too can be sometimes you'll try and, you know, businesses will try and design a tool that works for everyone, and, you know, those tools become, can become really, really complex. So you almost have to learn from scratch again how to use that, that, that tool and work out which bits are going to work for you and which one, which, you know, uh, functionality on that tool wasn't designed for you. So you sort of have to go through a manual. So if you can design uh, specific little tools, maybe that works a little bit better. I, I think rely on, on what's already there. Um, browsers, you can customise scaling. Um, you can get extensions for browsers that will change your colour scheme. Um, I, I wouldn't use an individual thing for each separate website that I, I go to. There's one on the floor. Yeah, you want to take one from the floor? Hi, um, it's Ruby from um, Guide Dogs. Just um, your, under your kind of personal preference um, w um, with regards to error indication um, when you're going through forums. Um, just going through the presentation, it was it was really good, but there wasn't anything regarding error indication. Now, sometimes there can be a bit of controversy on the preference. So when you type information into the edit box and it's a required field, once yeah. you submit into the next form, what would what you, what would you feel would be preferable um, for error indication? Would it be links or through header styles, large text? Um, so, what would um, you prefer? Uh, prefer? The gov.uk design system actually has a whole section devoted to error messages and how to do them well, um, which is brilliant. Um, I think error messages need to be uh, highlighted where the error is and what the error is. Um, but I don't know the system inside out, but I would I would suggest that's a really good reference to go to. I would agree that too, with that too, because like for me, if I'm zoomed in and using magnification quite close, I want to be, it to be really clear where that error is, especially if I filled in like quite a long form, um, and I have problems a lot of time with forms where that's not the case, and there's and it's even sometimes the message isn't very clear. It'd be like error one five seven four. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. So. I mean, good specific information about what the error is and where it is, for me, is quite helpful. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, um, I think it was last week Adobe released a design system called uh, Spectrum, um, which is a really good resource to have a look at. Um, 
they have some pretty good accessibility people, well, very good accessibility people, sorry, working internally that have invested a lot of effort into that design system. Um, it's across four different platforms. Uh, error messages is something that's definitely covered there, so it's worth having a look at. Any more from the floor? Hi there. Hello. Thank you for the talk. It was really, really interesting, really great. My name is Jean-Francois. And um, so often on forms on the internet or sometimes on web dialogues, like modal web dialogues, sometimes the buttons to submit the form or to press OK on the web dialogue are placed to the bottom right of the form of the web dialogue. Now, I try to convince the, the, my clients and the designers around me to try and put them to the left. Yep. I'd like to know how big a difference it makes when, yes. when, when, when you need to use screen magnification. Massive, massive difference. Um, thank you. Uh, finding those buttons when you're zoomed in um, and you can see a tiny portion of the screen, um, it's, it's a lot worse when the buttons are over on the far right. You might never find them. Um, but I would always campaign for the button to be uh, aligned to the left and under the text field that you're submitting. Yep, and I would agree. Yeah. One more on the floor. I'd agree as well with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Hello. Um, you mentioned you didn't like the chat pop-ups that pop up and obscure, and I have to say as a fully sighted using websites at a normal size, I hate them as well, because they pop up and obscure what you're trying to read anyway. But it, which, is there a way of doing it on a website so that they don't annoy you? Is it just a case of keeping them not popped up, or would you just not use them anyway because they don't work for you? Um, I've seen websites do it where they have, um, on the contact us pages, they have an option where you can click a link to go to live chat, which is far better for me because it doesn't obliterate half my screen with pop-ups that I didn't ask for. Okay, uh, one more from Slido. Uh, what standard tests do you suggest, i.e. resolution, zoom level, and colour scheme? Um, <laughs> so I think um, according to the accessibility statement that we just saw, it should be zoomable to 300%. In browser zoom, um, color schemes. Um, I would test with various. Um, yeah, test my own variety. Yeah, lots of different ones. But remember to test with inverted colors. I know that the gov.uk design system found out that when colors were inverted, selection boxes didn't show up when they were selected because the selector um, icon, for want of a better word, was black as well as the rest of the page, so they had to do a lot of work to remedy that. Um, but I would say test with it, at least five different colour schemes, make sure everything works in different colour schemes. Um, yeah, I would agree. Uh, on Windows, the, there's something called high, high contrast colour scheme, that's worth testing. Uh, on macOS, it's called uh, Smart Invert or Invert Colours, um, worth looking at. Um, any more from the floor? Yep. Yeah. Hi, sorry, one more on pop-ups. Um, sadly, we have loads of them. Uh, if we were to do pop-ups, is there a good way to make it better to dismiss them? So right now, I think we probably all used to seeing the cross at the top right. Um, is it could be made better for Zoom text or magnifier users? If you really must have pop-ups, really, really, <laughs> then make sure that you test with um, browser zoom to 300% and that that cross is accessible to users using that browser zoom level because that, that's the big problem that I showed you, that the cross is not accessible when you're zoomed in on a browser. Um, but test with users using all sorts of different software, test with screen reader users, test with um, people using Zoom text test with people um, using browser Zoom uh, to check that they work. So I think the Guardian um, website used to have 
some pop-ups that I couldn't navigate away from because, again, the cross was not accessible when I used an Android with extra large fonts, but they've since done a lot of work to remedy that and it does work now. So it is possible and people have done testing. Um, but if you really must use them. Your timing was immaculate. Really? You have oh. one minute to spare. <laughs> so thank you so much both. Um, I think Gavin really great has question time. So he, he does. Gavin, I've done my best to answer <laughs> all of your questions in the chat. Um, but if you maybe want to tell people how they can get in contact with you. Uh, sure, the easiest way is through our website, www.forest.co.uk. Uh, Hopefully it's not a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Gavin at littleforest.co.uk. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so if you did um, put, a chat, put a question in the chat for Gavin, they were kind of quite generic questions, Gavin, so um, I've tried to supply an answer for all of them. Um, but if you want more specific details, then you reach out to Gavin directly. Okay, thank you so much both. Yeah, do you need a hand? Are you okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so thank you all very much uh, for coming tonight. I um, really appreciate the turnout. Um, thank you to all the speakers, uh, Gavin, uh, Kevin, and Marion. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the sponsors as well. So Sainsbury's, Barclays, MyClearText, and Meetup Video. Thank you so much. Um, also, as well, a big thank you to the people that helped me run this event. Um, so Catherine and Ben, in particular tonight, um, I was massively late because of transport issues. So without their support tonight, there might not have been an event. So thank you very much. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>